Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar today entitled Global Talent Mobility, Critical to Talent and People's Success. Uh, just some general info before we get started. There will be a Q&A towards the end. If you have any questions, you'll see a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please drop any questions into there. We will share the recording and slides via email shortly after the session. And finally, if you run into any technical issues or if you have any questions or feedback, please email me at holly.smith at topia.com. So I'd like to um, introduce you to our speakers today. We are absolutely thrilled to be joined by our special guest, David Wilson. David is the founder and CEO of Fosway Group. Europe's number one HR industry analyst. A major commenter on the HR, talent and learning industries for over 20 years, David is a strategic advisor to many major corporate and supplier organizations in the UK and Europe. David personally leads Fosway's research and corporate advisory agenda and is the author of over 150 research papers and articles. We also have our very own Steve Black, co-founder and chief strategy officer here at Topia. Since co-founding Topia in 2011, Steve has been here to see the company grow from a small London-based startup to an award-winning global talent mobility management platform, supporting organizations around the world. At Topia, Steve leads strategic initiatives leveraging deep industry technology and customer insights. An expatriate himself, originally from the US, Steve understands the challenges of moving abroad and is dedicated to ensuring that everything we do at Topia is in the best interest of our customers. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our speakers. Hi, um, everybody, and thank you from, from me too, uh, in terms of uh, joining us today. Um, I'd like to uh, switch across. So hopefully that's 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 showing okay. Um, like to uh, say thank you from behalf of Fosway as well. Um, looking forward to a really interesting conversation with Steve today around the whole topic around uh, global talent mobility and you know I think what we're seeing is a, a really exponential growth in the importance of some of the topics around this, uh, particularly obviously due to what's been going on with COVID and the, uh, and the pandemic, um, the consequence of the pandemic. So if you're not familiar with Fosway, we're an industry analyst firm. We're based in the UK, but we focus on European organizations, typically European multinationals or the European global firms, um, and very much large kind of enterprise stuff and, and downwards from that. Um, we also publish a number of things, some of which I'm going to talk about today in terms of trends research, etc. And um, some of you may be familiar with us from our Fosway 9 grids, which are our market assessment, looking at key market spaces and so on. And, uh, you know, I've got a few slides before we're going to hand over to Steve and then we're going to go into a discussion. And one of the things we want to talk about is some of the recent research we've been announcing around what we're calling talent and people success. Um, from a general context point of view, just I thought it'd be worth worth going back and just talking about some of these things because um, just to give us a sense of really of where we're coming from and what some of the challenges were even before the pandemic, of course. The, the first one, which I think is a pretty well-trodden narrative, which is skills um, are, are a massive issue for um, for you know, all organizations, or vast majority of organizations. You know, we did some research in our 2020 um, HR realities research looking at the, um, the, the ability to get hold of skills. So this is just prior, immediately prior to COVID. And we got 93% of organizations found it's very difficult for them to hire skills. And interestingly enough, whilst COVID has created lots of economic impact and obviously has created a situation where many companies are you know, furloughed staff or laid off staff, et cetera, because of it, and, and you know, with huge, huge implications. Interestingly, the way that's impacted the skills market is, is, is really challenging in the sense that the areas of growth 
particularly around digital and more transformational stuff, have often been the things that were hardest to acquire in the first place. So just because there's been a big shift in things like unemployment doesn't necessarily mean it's addressed some of the higher skill areas that we've we had challenges in previously. And critically, I think, as a consequence of the, the pandemic, what we've seen is a big impact in the way that obviously HR functions and talent functions have had to respond, uh, have responded to this. And, um, you know, the, that pressure around skills particularly has created kind of a, a real, real need for organizations to look at how they optimize their workforce and looking at how they, um, you know, reskill um, or um, you know, transform their kind of organization and operating model. 39, this is some corn ferry research, but 13, 39% of HR leaders saying they're also trying to use that as a way of changing their priorities um, around talent. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, so we're seeing really significant impacts, not just in terms of employment, but also, and skills, but in terms of the, the approach that companies are taking to talent too. Um, and that's really for us leading to what we're kind of we're talking about as a new wave in in kind of HR innovation and HR evolution. Um, you know, we always talk about the level of change within HR being so significant, you know, being very significant. But genuinely, I think in one fell swoop, we've seen a massive, massive transition. Obviously, with first of all, HR just trying to focus on understanding the direct impacts of things like the pandemic, but then also really trying to work out how it responded to that, keep the lights on in the business effectively to start with, but then also move into trying to think about is what does the shape of that workforce need to be going forward? And that's creating lots and lots of new pressures. The other thing is that we've seen in, you know, in, our, in our, again, realities research, you know, we ask a lot about the background drivers that companies are trying to uh, um, trying to align to and what their biggest challenges are. And whilst the number one answer typically in all, ca in, in all cases, every time we've asked that has been around driving organization performance and, and profitability, the number two driver that's, that's kind of emerged up again pre-COVID was, was around business agility and enabling companies to respond much faster to the level of change. And ironically, actually, HR has maybe in many cases been a laggard function. You know, we've been digitizing parts of the business operating model for many years and only now really starting to take a more transformational approach around some of the HR processes. This, this diagram is a sort of reflection of what we're really thinking about as being the sort of the, 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 the next kind of shift here and this is actually based on uh, interestingly a sort of or inspired by a, uh, a model that nasa used talking around things like moon landings and the, you know things related to that but really looking at how we're seeing companies focus on the organizations focus on being on much more agile and the view that they have of talent and the way that talent engages in that story is also becoming much more agile as well and looking at that blend if you like of things like Yes, people and work, but also around the purpose and the innovation. So things like around, you know, how do we um, enable people's success? How do we drive, you know, energy and organizational fluidity? Um, how do we make the processes a lot more agile? How do we upskill and reskill people, etc.? And overall, how do we create a an experience around this that's a lot more seamless um, and probably intelligent as well, and and the kind of at the heart of all of this, or in the in you know in in the sweet spot in the, mem the, the of this Ben diagram is is something which is around we're talking around um, democratizing, accelerating the flow of talent. You know that whole shift around you know how we view talent. Talent's not just a a view thing for top level people or of your high performers this is something this is an issue now that really is transcending lots of organizations and that's driving i think a really big shift in the talent story on the left hand side here you will see what we call the kind of the old foundation so this is more the traditional sort of talent life cycle um that, that is still in many organizations and what we've seen is this get quite disrupted so to some degree, it's being, some of this is being sucked into the HR and HCM space, you know, with some of the, the, the big HR vendors particularly trying to embed these processes within their overall offering set. But at the same time that's been going on, we've seen significant disruption 
um, and the evolution of kind of new, much more dynamic approaches around each of these topic areas. You know, so it's less about, the, you know, that personal development is important, but we're really, really focused around things like reskilling and upskilling. You know, the traditional appraisal approaches is being re replaced by almost a continuous mentoring model, um, internal job boards by things like gig marketplaces and so on and things like this. So it's not that the left side has gone away. It's just been really kind of transformed and disruptive by a, a kind of right side agenda with a much more differentiating story here in terms of what we're looking for. And, and one of the big topics that we're seeing um, impacted by this, both because of that skills agenda and because of that much more agile, much more dynamic, is around talent mobility. Lots of the organizations that we talk to are really trying to understand how they opt you know, how they can optimize and move, um, uh, you know, redeploy and um, skills and capability in the organization on a much more dynamic basis, um, less associated with historical hierarchical models, much more, much more, whether it's not necessarily always gigs, but in terms of a much more dynamic approach. And I think ultimately within that, that defines a set of kind of opportunities and challenges, which like lead us to the conversation that kind of we're having today, because this is an area where we're seeing pretty much all the large enterprise type organizations really starting to focus on how they do this and how they enable this in a much more effective way. And ultimately this all fits into a big kind of effectively overall ecosystem. The, the, uh, the diagram I'm showing here is the what we call the Fosways um, HCM solution model. And we've kind of reworked that in 2020 to change certain things. So for example, we've put skills in the, in, in the core really as, a, as, a, as something that really kind of transcends all now, all of these talent layers and so on. Um, and we've sort of reworked quite a lot of the, if you like the outer hexagon layer in terms of things, you know, whether that's from recruiting and talent acquisition through to things like career and mobility and performance, et cetera, really about being able to engage with these more, more disruptive processes and these more disruptive outcomes. And one of the things the pandemic's done is, is, is really kind of hugely accelerate the need to show outcome from this. You know that that that's, that's that's a critical issue for organisations. Is you know they they haven't got missed multiple years to invest in showing things that deliver an outcome. They really want to be able to do that fast. Um, and and ultimately, all of those changes we're talking about has lead us towards around thinking about how companies are ultimately rethinking work as well as working and teams you know the way that this all fits together so we talk about within Fosway the sort of accelerators for kind of people success and and people empowerment you know and you can see again you can see it looks like a life cycle but there's a fundamental shift in how how this is and we're looking up on the right hand side of this top right hand side really thinking around you know that whole ta talent mobility and, p and mobility optimization and a lot of these themes which ultimately I think really well align with, you know, what Topia is trying to do as an organization. And, and, and I look forward to having more of that conversation with, with, with Steve as uh, later on. Ultimately for us, um, and I mentioned our Fosway 9 grids earlier, this is leading towards a kind of significant recalibration away from what we talked about historically within Fosway as a, an integrated talent management view um, towards now a much more kind of disruptive talent and people success model. So we've gone through this, this was announced at the end of October. It's generated a kind of huge amount of interest. I think, well, you know, one of the original LinkedIn things has got 80,000 kind of people that have viewed that and participating in it. So really kind of generating a lot of interest around it and really thinking now about not just that, as I said, that democratization of talent and the ability to provide this and support this across the broader organization, but thinking about, you know, who are, you know, the, 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 from a suite perspective, you know, who are the main suite players, but also where are these disruptive specialists and how, they, how are they gonna play in and drive a value proposition for you? And how does that fit into that broader ecosystem I was talking about? bringing together the disruptive trends and the kind of more transformational priorities. Um, and we think this is something that's a lot more of its time. It's reflective of the trends we were already seeing, but we think the pandemic ultimately has really, really pushed this forward. So um, the research I've talked about today is, is kind of, um, 
you know, some of this is obviously available publicly from the website. One thing I'll say about the nine grids is think about, don't just think about the, the diagram, the pretty picture, if you like, but think about what's behind that, you know, and ultimately, if, if these are topics you're interested in looking at, you know, come and talk to us about it because obviously we have also tools and things you know we're an analyst firm that's what we're trying to do but we also have some tools that can help you accelerate some of those that that thinking and the research data points and a lot of the others including some covid research we've done around for hr is available from our website um, as well as the nine grids of course so on that point i will kind of hand across really to steve and talk a bit more about this from a topia perspective Perfect. Thank you, David. Um, always good to, to get a bit of context and an update on, on what you guys are working on, and in particular, I think how you guys have rethought uh, the traditional talent management space. Um, we've certainly been arguing there's time for a change for, for quite a while, so uh, good to good to see some of that um, in in the flesh, as it were. So uh, you know, with the with with David setting the scene around uh, the sort of Fosway perspective and, and the Nine Grid. I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes here, you know, for folks that maybe are familiar with Fosway and less familiar with Topia and the global talent mobility category, um, just a little bit of scene setting so that the uh, back half of the conversation and, and discussion between David and I makes sense and, and has some context. So when we talk about the category of global talent mobility, we're really talking about the function within a business that's helping effectively deploy manage and engage employees that are away from the office, all while staying compliant. And that, that away from the office, uh, the definition, the implication of that have changed certainly dramatically this year. And, you know, the, the, the punchline, though, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the punchline, though, is that global talent mobility is more critical now than ever before. And I think that's, uh, you know, certainly indicated a bit by, for the first time ever, really, um, the, the Fosway Group covering the global talent mobility space as part of the HR landscape, but also what we're seeing as I'm out there talking with CHROs and, and other leaders, um, it's become a you know, spotlighted function this year with so much going on from a, from a COVID and remote work perspective. But if you uh, sort of um, listen to what's happening in the news, uh, right, you hear, uh, you hear a lot uh, that would suggest maybe the category isn't that important. You hear uh, business travel is, is gone forever and it's Zoom for the, for the rest of our lives, as, uh, as scary as that might sound. You hear employee relocation is dead. Uh, the future is 100% remote. We, we can all cancel our office leases, uh, move out to the countryside and you know, plan to work in, in a new style and in a new way. And I think that the reality is actually just much more complicated than that. Right, business travel isn't going away completely. Uh, it will come back. I think Bill Gates was saying he was projecting that you know 30% less than than maybe at its peak. Um, but whatever that number looks like, it's it's coming back as certainly with vaccine news, um, but in a more complex landscape. Uh, we've got you know the European Posted Workers Directive that went into effect in Europe this year. Nobody's really had to deal with that because travel was was pretty limited. And you know, I think as as we see the vaccine start to roll out, this topic or conversation of COVID passports or how, who's been vaccinated and who hasn't will start to play into to travel in in, in 2021. And certainly, as we're, we're talking with employees, just as much as we are with with HR leaders, there is still absolutely this desire and excitement uh, and and hunger for individuals to have international global experiences as part of their career development. And I think study time and time again has shown that folks are willing to do that, perhaps without a, you know, a significant increase in pay, um, but because they understand the opportunity for, for development and, and uh, progression. And when you look back over the uh, story of the category of, of global talent mobility, 15, 20 years ago, it was really about a handful of very um, specific, very expensive senior executive ex expats. They run, you know, lavish, uh, expensive packages, costing the you know company hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, plus a year. Um, and what that really meant was it was few and far between. Uh, the internet was was really in its infancy, and, and data and information were, were hard to come by. And then we've seen this explosion really over, over the last decade of the, the, the types uh, and underlying cost structures for different models of mobility. So short-term and long-term assignments on creative compensation packages to make it more effective for the business. 
lots of one-way permanent transfers uh, between offices uh, around the globe, uh, a huge spike in talent acquisition teams, recruiting anywhere on earth and finding the best people and then bringing them to the location that they needed to be. And I think before um, before COVID uh, joined us this year, you know, really we were starting to see this this topic of business travel compliance uh, and regulation and understanding your employee employee footprint was starting to come onto the agenda uh, for from a strategic and compliance perspective for mobility teams. We we quickly skipped over that one though uh, and went on straight to remote work, and I think you know if you, if you were to draw you know the curve behind the percentage of the population touched by mobility teams over this journey, it's certainly been one of exponential growth, and we're we're at that hockey stick inflection point this year, and that's already on top of uh, you know increasing compliance challenges, uh, cost pressure from the business certainly accelerated over the course of this year. But with a recognition that there is still a, a core part of this story uh, around talent, employee experience, retention, and development, and without that piece of the puzzle, you can't attract and, and retain the, the best folks. And as, as, as David mentioned, we've been talking about agility for quite a while now, uh, but this year has moved it from theory and buzzword for lots of folks to the reality, like it or not, right? The, number of scenario plans, uh, number of reforecasts, and the number of just adjustments that organizations have had to make this year has, has been incredible. And that's meant a, a big opportunity uh, for mobility teams, but also you know, a real stretch uh, for those that were you know, heavily operating in a manual world or an outsourced world or, or relying on Excel and, and email for, for much of that process. And, you know, w when I think about the new normal, uh, to, to use a, an overused phrase, certainly, I think the, the everything I'm hearing, you know, vaccine aside and, and, and even beyond 2021, right, is that the new normal is going to be increasingly complex, flexible, and, and fluid. So as you think about an organization's talent strategy, it needs to be completely woven in with the global talent mobility strategy. You can't have sort of two sides of the coin disconnected and be thinking about strategy and the movement and location of people differently. It needs to be woven together. And we've seen, you know, many leading organizations pulling functions that have been potentially different parts of the business or parts of HR before, pulling those together to really weave that, um, weave that conversation and strategy together. I think there's also a big piece um, around getting ahead of new risks and regulations. So you know, we, we've seen actually a, a pretty relaxed year when it comes to compliance of where people are working, given the nature of the pandemic, how it evolved, and the reality of closed borders, quarantines, and, and the like. But I think the, the thing that we're, we're, we're highly confident of is as we head into 2021, Governments around the world uh, are going to be in serious budget deficit, and they will find a way to come calling for folks that aren't on staying on top of compliance and, and regulation. So, you know, for lots of organizations, they're now going through a, a digital transformation journey, perhaps that they thought was a few years away, to get ahead of, of some of that and prepare. And there's a really interesting conversation developing on this mix of where should my people be working based on employment contract, perhaps? Uh, where are they actually working and where do they want to be working? And I expect that we'll go through, uh, you know, a series of, of conversations and evolution around what's the right mix of talent deployment models for each organization. And then what fundamentally is the data technology and information you need to support that complexity. So I, I think this new normal is is one of complexity and, and one of challenge. And the question is going to be, you know, who, who can step up to that um, and really lean in and, and win the talent wars in an in increasingly compact, complex and uh, competitive environment. So that's, uh, that's the uh, end of the slide section of this, um, but we wanted to at least set the tables for, um, you know, for everyone. Uh, with a bit of context around both the, the, the Fosway experience and, and thinking, as well as uh, the Topia's perspective around global talent mobility. So should we dive into uh, to, to some of the detail, David? Sounds a good idea to me. Great. So I, I think, you know, one of the things um, that, you know, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about was a, 
understanding, you know, from a, from a Fosway perspective is, you know, why start covering the global talent mobility category, you know, now, um, obviously it's, it's been something that I know you've looked at over the years, but you know, what's the reason it's now in the, in the landscape and, and you alluded to this, this topic of, you know, specialist disruptors as part of a broader HR ecosystem. So yeah. maybe shed a little bit of light for folks on, on that that might not be as familiar with the, the category or its, you know, reach in the HR space. Yeah, and so thanks, Steve, for that. And I mean, the other thing I was kind of conscious of is that I stuck the nine grid up, which had Topia on it, and didn't actually talk about where Topia was, which was uh, which was probably something you'd like me to do as well. So, I think uh, generally the point that we've seen is, and, and we've been on this journey for some time, right, from a phosphate point of view, mm. as looking as this evolving story, you know, from foundations which were around systems of record and then vendors start talking about you know systems of engagement and the experience layers and all of these sort of buzz terms that you're coming out of the market and i think one of the things that we've been increasingly looking at as i said is from you know from a broader hr process so some of this is is not specific obviously to global talent mobility and it's it's just a reflection that what we've seen is Mm. that you know, the traditional talent life cycle to some degree has got increasingly sucked into the HCM world and in in the kind of cloud HCM. And that, you know, often the traditional, also the, 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 the bulk processes certainly have, and then the higher value processes, which historically maybe have been particularly for European and and international companies, Mm -hmm. maybe a little bit more selective in where they've been targeted that started to become increasingly challenges and needed to be more diversified. And what we've seen underneath this is the growth of these very kind of disruptive um, specialist um, kind of application areas and, and kind of topics, which are kind of being rethought and redone all the time. So becoming more dynamic, more continuous, more, mm-hmm. more engaged, higher experience outcomes and things like this. So we've seen a lot of topics across those life cycle. And, and, and then we felt really that what we needed to do was to reflect that change back into the suite and specialist story. And that became, a, that was a more relative, more, more relevant narrative, if you like, for describing the different types of vendors that we saw in the market. And mm-hmm ultimately what corporates were needing to buy Um, but as I said within there you know one of the areas I mean we've been we've been sort of tracking the the global talent mobility story for a few years in fact and um, but I think one of the things that we became really aware of is if you like the disruptive impact that that can have and the value proposition that creates for companies so both how difficult you know going back to the earlier parts maybe the middle of your uh, your spectrum your your Mm -hmm. change you know, basically, you know, there's a very strong commercial value proposition about doing that well when it came to business travel and, you know, sort of m- the, the the sort of bigger capital M on mobility. Sure. Um, and that was really starting to drive, I think, very strong value stories. You know, we talked to, obviously, as part of our, our research and nine grids are very um, the, the customer influence is the strongest influence in all of this, right? Not what the vendors say about themselves, but what the customers yeah. say. You know, when you start talking to customers that basically couldn't do, can't do their job without this stuff being in place, or they're exposing their organization to consequential risk financially, or, you mm-hmm. know, in, individual employees, then that's some things you need to start listening and listen, listen, listening to. And I think then the other thing, and you talked about that quite eloquently, I think at the end is that transition to, really focusing on who's not working in the office right and what is our kind of our our risk and exposure as well as what is our enablement layer around making that truly effective right and that went in one fell swoop from being in most companies a you know 10 percent or of the company to being 90 percent of the company or 100 percent of the company in some cases and you know clearly that's a massive magnifier of value And, and and understanding how you respond to that um, even understanding how you track where everybody is and, you know, understanding whether they're working or not working or uh, et cetera, becomes really, really critical. So I think that topic together with this whole thing, and I talked about, you know, the skills and mobility question from a talent point of view mm-hmm. really come together, I think, to make this an important topic. 
Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. And we've seen, it's been interesting, you know, certainly this year um, as the the balance of, you know, what folks are coming to us to talk about and explore has, you know, we've, we've always had this, you know, uh, the, the big M as you alluded to it in, in mobility of the, the complex messy stuff of how do I get 30 people in a project into this country in this timeline, the cost effectively and in compliance. And that's, it's really, of course, shifted to this now the problem that's facing every organization, which is where that where are my people, <laughs> right? And this um, it was interesting, I guess, evolution as it as it was of of um, that conversation over the course course of this year, right? So it started in you know February March timeframe when we we all heard COVID for the first time with, okay, who's been to Italy? Who's been to China? Where are they now? When are borders closing? How on earth do we get these people out of the country if we need to, or do we leave them there? Type type conversations. Mm-hmm. And so for, for lots of mobility teams, that was, um, uh, you know, for one of the first times for many, the spotlight of the CEO was shining very brightly, right, on that on that function of we need the data, we need to understand this. And some organizations were fortunate, they put tools and, and, and stuff in place, and others, I think, were in scrambling mode. I've heard an awful lot about Excel spreadsheets this year, right, of, you know, self-reported location based on, you know, who we could get a hold of type, type conversation. Mm-hmm. And then there's been this, um, you know, maturation of of the conversation and of the thinking of the ideas. Partially went through. <clears throat> okay, now people are safe. We've gotten through the first hurdle, but employees are starting to come and ask us, "Hey, we've said we're not going to have the office open for the next six months or maybe twelve months. I, can I go move closer to be with family, who's maybe a state or two away, or maybe in the north of England, or maybe in a different country?" And um, a lot of ad hoc conversation, right, around, okay, how do we evaluate that? And there's a whole litany of a checklist that you need to go through of, do I have an entity there? Can I run payroll there? What are the social security regulations? What are the, you know, and on and on down, down the line. And I think we, we've now gotten to a point where everyone gets the risk, right? It's, it's, it's sort of now... I can see it coming. I can see the regulatory um, uh, changes or or holding us to account for the, the real regulations that maybe we got to pass on this year. And now how do I at scale understand where people are? Because asking people to self-report, you know, uh, in certain industries and, and with certain implications may not be enough. Um, and so the conversation a lot has started to shift to this okay, we've decided we're going to track people. How do we do that in a compliant way? How do we do that in a way that doesn't scare people? And how do we communicate the, you know, what we're trying to do and, and why? So it's really, you know, transformed the, the course of the, and the sort of scope of the conversation over, you know, just the last nine months, really. Yeah, I mean, some of that, Steve, comes through in the research that we did earlier in the year, looking at the kind of response to COVID. And mm-hmm. as you said, a lot of this is manager conversations tracked through spreadsheets and, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, frankly, what that means is it's never up to date, it's never perfect, et cetera. Um, maybe some parallels with the the test and trace type stuff that's going on, you know, in terms of the broader broader economy and COVID. But I mean, at the end of the day, there is some really kind of fundamental issues. Obviously, we've also seen companies, um, you know, and we'll, who knows what this is going to turn out to be like longer term. But you've seen companies who have... Um, you know, made statements about shutting offices permanently or staff can work wherever they are. We've also seen some of them, e.g. Facebook, I think, for example, talk mm-hmm. about, and by the way, this is going to impact your compensation at some point, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and as you, you know, as you said, in, uh, you know, that may impact which, you know, from a tax point of view and all sorts of other things. And I think, I think it's just a minefield, right? So, and that minefield has got exponentially more complicated. Um, so there are already, as I said, there are already clear drivers and, and a very clear value proposition around doing this well both from a a a cost you know of a cost management point of view but ultimately also from a risk management perspective um which had huge you know consequences of it we've now just multiplied that by a factor of 10 possibly in terms of what it means and i think it's not clear how that's going to unwind so definitely i think this is a space that 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 is you know first of all worthy of more attention and secondly Mm -hmm. is actually needs to be thought about as a specialism, but also as part of that bigger ecosystem story in terms of how does this really connect in, you know, which is I know, I know is an area that you focus on a lot. Yeah, and it, it's interesting because the um, the nice thing about it for for organizations is 
there's there's an immediate problem of the, where my people that are now working remotely, right? And I was talking to a CHRO yesterday, and the way they found out a lot about a, a lot of hidden uh, hidden movement of their staff during COVID was they were sending out uh, company sweatshirts, so San Francisco tech company, of course, right? When but people update their address when they've got a, you know some free clothes coming, and all of a sudden, you know, dozens of people popping up around the country, like I had no idea you were in the state. You know, you actually might not be allowed to work there type type conversations. And so I, I, we've seen that the, those sorts of interesting and eye opening um, things things start to happen. But you know, you, if you solve that first problem of where are my remote workers, then you're also actually in a great place to solve the problem of where are my business travelers when travel starts to open back up. And then you're in a great place when actual physical movement of on a permanent basis or a longer you know basis um, starts to open back up. And so I think we'll we'll start to see, and we're already seeing, you know these transformations within this part of, of HR tech and within mobility that have maybe been on the back burner, you know, I've been pleasantly surprised about how many folks are getting budget or, or proving a strong ROI case case study, you know, even in the middle, midst of a pandemic, because they can see the sort of growth and expansion, particularly as they think about how am I going to manage my talent pool over the long run, right? Yeah. I mean, again, another interesting point that we saw from some of our research is, 20% of the organizations we're talking to had extended extended their kind of licensing and, and put, new, or put new solutions in. Uh, interestingly, companies that already had maybe some digital platforms in for managing these kinds of processes may have found it twice as easy to respond and adjust to some of the COVID-related drivers and pe companies that had no capability found it three times harder, right? So there's a maturity around the ability to engage in some of these topics as well, which quite significantly impact the ability to respond um mm -hmm. you know and uh, and as i said that's let alone those longer term more more nuanced maybe uh, topics that then emerge from that so yeah and, and i was going to ask you know your your perspective you know not just in global talent mobility specifically but more broadly you know what have you seen this year um, from uh, technology investment from from organizations, particularly in the HR space, where people have been willing to invest, where people may maybe pump the brakes a little bit. What's that? What's that looked like? So I mean, we I mean, first of all, for the probably the last five years, when we look at investment priorities and we look at growth things, we've seen uh, investment in technology-related solutions, 70%, pretty much on average, 70% of companies are increasing their investment in, in HR technology when you, and probably um, investing there in upskilling HR and probably slightly reducing the number of HR staff. So there was a background mm -hmm. pattern that was already there. So we want, we want HR to be more trans transformational, less transactional. We want to automate a lot more stuff. And that's been driving a lot of things across pretty much the whole piece. I think what's interesting when COVID came, you know, we went through the March, April sky falling in moment when literally it was just okay. And we saw, I think then um projects you know some some projects some investments freeze we saw hr you know functions get furloughed and staff getting mm -hmm. furloughed which obviously then impacted certain things but then really very quickly afterwards maybe there was i think maybe a four to six week period where it was kind of really uncertain nobody knew what it was um obviously when you look at we look at a lot also at the vendor side of that story where yeah. vendors were basically like freezing hiring and spending and everything else like that and then what's happened very quickly is they kind of worked out that the stuff, you know, if you're in the digital HR, HR game in almost any guise, the stuff you do was fundamentally a lot more important to the client, mm. right? Um, most of the vendors have talked about two to 300% increase in utilization of platforms from existing customers. Almost everybody, of course, has got very creative about adding COVID-related capabilities and portals and making you know adding value so um and, you know not sorry and not charging necessarily not not charging for that stuff but just making it easier for customers to leverage their platform in a way that yeah. responded to the pandemic and that's just massively increased i think the the the, the case to be there so um, I think that the caveat under all of these things is what I touched on earlier about time to value. I think if you're looking at solutions where 
you're spending two years to build a new core HR database on which you're going to then run all that other stuff. I think some of that has been impacted, not mm. least by, you know, sometimes the team is not there and intact in order to be able to run it forward. But I think when you're looking especially at these agile specialism related, you know, thinking my left side, right side diagram, when I had that list of things, pretty much everything on that right side was seeing as, as being an accelerated by need. As I said, I think 21% of companies have increased uh, licensing values, 10% put new sol- were putting new solutions in place, even at the point of biggest risk, if you're uncertainty, you know, going back to that sort of um, April, May, June timeframe, um, mm-hmm. that was already started to clear- clearly happen. And I think that's going to drive going forward into 2021. I don't think that momentum is going to slow down. And I think you're seeing that reflected in, to some degree, you know, the 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 financials of most a lot of the vendors that that are out there, you're seeing it reflected in the stock market values around um, you know tech firms. Obviously, we know that that's that's that those values have kind of continued to grow, um, and you've certainly seen it in terms of, as I said, utilization of platforms and the kind of value around it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think it's been, um, you know, certainly if, if I look at our our world, right, if you think about the the movement of, of people and where, where people are, um, you know, from a technology perspective, it's been a much better year than, than I ever would have expected if you'd asked me yeah, 12 months ago, what is it, what does a global pandemic do? And I think, to your point, it, it goes, to, you know, there was a pause of, hey, what's going on? What, how bad is this going to get? What are we going to do? But I think we've certainly seen second half of this year, a real, okay, we now understand what we're going to do. We now, we now have decided we're going to be remote for the next 12 or 18 months or whatever in some cases. Now, how are we going to manage that? What tools do we need in place? Um, and what's what what's the investment case for that versus you know other other spend right from a technology or, or other perspective? And you know, in, in some cases, even in the more traditional mobility part of the world, you know, it's hey, we've got. 2,000, 4,000 expats around the world today. Maybe they're not coming back home just yet, but there's still, you know, payroll compensation and other things to manage. And actually we now have had to reduce the size of our shared service center. So how are we going to deliver against that need, right? And we need technology to be able to do that at scale and, and, and those mm. sorts of things. And my assumption is that as we start to kind of open up, we also have a whole bunch of new considerations that we're trying to to kind of manage in there and, um, and not least because obviously the speed of which things open up in different countries is also going to be different the regs mm-hmm. related to um, you know quarantining or pandemics or approval you know sort of uh, certifications you need related to stuff you know that's going to I mean for the next 12 months or so I assume we're going to be living with that all the time Absolutely. I think the uh, the uncertainty will continue um, even as things start to open back up. And I think this planning and replanning a couple hundred times is, <laughs> will, will, will be the norm. So uh, folks uh, folks certainly need to be be ready for that. Um, as we, we will save a, a few minutes here at the end for folks that have any questions, so feel free to submit them. Um, but I, I wanted, before we, we jumped into that, I wanted to maybe get um, your thoughts on whether you've got a couple predictions of, of what the broader HR tech world is going to look like um, as we head into next year, right? We're approaching December. It's, it's the time for those uh, time for those predictions to uh, to come in. So any 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 thoughts there on the, the sort of major themes or, or uh, what's going to happen next year? Yeah, I mean, so um, I mean, I think certainly some of the trends that we're already seeing will continue to to kind of play out, right? So we talked about, I mean, you know, the the, the re-engineering and the re-architecture of core HR, shifting that into the cloud, the growth of some of these HCM things, the the continued rise of the specialists as well, um, um, probably coupled with quite a lot of um, mergers of acquisitions type activity. I mean, we've already started to see that impact the market as well. Um, you know, companies, again, maybe if they want to create a certain offer are looking at acquiring special, you know, disruption rather than just yeah. natively building it, et cetera. Um, I think from a company point of view, the the big shift away from the basic keep the lights on and how do we function when people are working from home towards how do we become an effective business you know in a in a semi virtual mm-hmm. world um and all the things that's driving around you know we i think the general perceptions are is that there is a a kind of a hidden engagement well-being problem that's underneath a lot of mm-hmm. this as well 
um, and um, you know that's going to become increasingly, I think, obvious. Um, the, other, the other things are stuff like teams. You know, we tend to think a lot around individuals, people, and whatever, but actually the whole way in which we want to look at this from a team point of view and how we make that a lot more agile as well. Um, I think those are all areas of growth. Um, I do think, although for many companies, it's kind of interesting when I look at things like the recruitment part of the market and so mm-hmm. on. You sit there and go, well you know, surely like most companies are just not recruiting. Well, some are recruiting, well, what was it Amazon 100,000 or 250,000 right. new employees or something um, leading into Christmas. And it was 250,000 new and 100,000 temp staff or something crazy. Right. Um, so you've either, you've got this implode explode thing going on. Yeah. Um, and then companies, you know, a lot of this stuff is not that fit for purpose, right? So when we ask companies whether their talent systems are fit for the modern workforce, the best part of 70% of them say no. So despite right. that historic investment, I think, you know, the need for greater change is there. And I think, again, the pandemic has probably magnified a lot of those, 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 those drivers, et cetera, around it. So, um, and I guess the last piece I'd probably focus on is what really drives business outcome for us, right? Mm-hmm. So I think we can focus a lot on, tech and new process and stuff for its own sake and because it's a sexy thing to do or or whatever it is but actually i think there's a lack of um you know hr really has has to now step up and become a key driver function in this you know we've just proven in pretty much all industry that without the people piece of that are our biggest asset, but actually they are in fact the the thing that keeps the keeps the business functioning. So I think being able to drive that effectively um, and and what really drives outcomes for organisations in that, I think that's going to become, you know, the, a critical topic for companies to focus more on as a, as HR tries to have more real impact, tangible impact, and more presence then in the C suite in the strategy of a business. Yeah, no, a- absolutely. I think, you know, we're, we're, we're already seeing the seeds of a lot of that. Um, and, you know, I think it'll be an interesting to see how that how that plays out. I think, you know, as I think about, you, you know, the, the key things and the key conversations I expect to happen from a global talent mobility perspective for next year, you know, I think this, um, this, this location conversation uh, is going to come to a head. I think we saw early in the year, a lot of conversation and a lot of negative press for some organizations around, you know, keyboard logging software or software to check where you're at your desk, you know, how many hours a day were you putting in and that sort of stuff. And there was a, a lot of blowback, understandably, around trust, around privacy, right? And and frankly, you know, families, you know, I've got two small kids and for the spring, there was no childcare, no school. And um, I was not working anything close to a regular schedule if you're looking at, at, at hours, you know, nine to five in front of a keyboard or whatever it is. And so I, I think we'll see a, a sort of second wave of these conversations around the world of remote work and around this understanding where employees are. And I think we've seen a few organizations already starting to do it really well when they're able to articulate what, why do we need this information, right? There's a corporate risk you might not even be aware of. There's a personal risk from a compliance, from a tax perspective. You overstay in certain countries, you're going, they're going to take you to jail, right? So there's real, real sort of implications. Um, and I think there's a big piece we always counsel organizations on of make sure you're tracking at the least granular level of data possible for your use case. So, you know, if you think about it from a tax perspective, my employer, maybe they care whether I'm in London or, you know, um, Leeds, but they, it doesn't matter actually from a tax or a compliance perspective. They care if I'm in the UK or I'm in France or I'm back visiting family in the US, right? Mm. And so I think it's that um, that openness of conversation that that taking people on that journey and helping people understand the, the risk and implications to the company after what's been a tough year for lots of organizations that have seen layoffs and change. And I think presented in the right way, you know, we've seen, you know, employees not have any issue with it. I think pre- presented in the wrong way or maybe hidden um, uh, without without enough uh, conversation up front, then all of a sudden you've got a PR challenge on your hands, not to mention the, the compliance risk uh, if you're not able to, uh, to, to figure out where folks are. And then I, I think the second thing, you know, that I think is going to happen in, in, in 2021 I mean, realistically, it'll probably be towards the second half of the year, but borders will start to open, movement will start again, and it's likely that after an initial trickle, we'll see it at a volume 
right? That we haven't seen in 18 months, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think organizations getting ready to handle that that shift overnight, almost it will feel like, I think in some cases to increased movement, you know, people traveling for work, people trying to get to that sales meeting, people getting the team together, um, you know, after a year or so away from each other. And so I think being ready for that um, to open uh, and ready for this big growing backlog, frankly, and we can see it from our data of, of customers using the platform, the planning for relocations is still happening. It is. Um, it hasn't slowed down nearly as much as I would have expected at all. So there's just this building backlog almost of folks that are ready to go when 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 the time is right, when they feel safe, and when the green light comes. And so I think we'll we'll see some interesting challenges maybe on the supply chain side when uh, when those things those things start to to happen. But I think it will be certainly next year. It will be an interesting one uh, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting there is you get to see the data behind, right? So you've got mm -hmm. a sense of where some of that backlog and reality is, which in a way, lots of other people are either just running surveys or, or, or um, speculating over. And I think yeah. that's an interesting observation. Uh, I, I guess the question for me, for you, which is we can focus a lot with the global talent mobility story around risk and optimization for the for the company. But I think one of the things that seems interesting to me around this um, you know, as we move away from a, you've got to be in the office, right, to at least a partly flexible working relationship, and maybe for a lot of people, a completely yeah. flexible one, um, that creates opportunities. So, you know, what's what's in it from the employee perspective? I mean, as well as obviously making sure that they're that we don't screw up their tax or their moves or their whatever it is, you know, the traditional kind of things that you would have you would expect to be, but. I mean, how does, do you think this will enable that flexible workforce kind of model to be, to, to frankly just exist and be more flexible? Because I think a lot of people are making very blanket statements around that with yeah. no real understanding of the reality of that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, I mean, and I, I use those news headlines in, in my section earlier, because I think that the media loves an extreme, right? We're all, the office is dead and, and then those sorts of things. But I think for, for employees, I was, I was talking to, to a friend of mine um, who is on the job market now in the tech sector. And it, it was a really interesting conversation about the job search because it's, it's now a, what's the role? What's the company? But also what's the working model? So yeah. I know if, I, if I'm talking to Salesforce, uh, they, I, I, the next 12 months I won't have to go into an office, but after that I probably will. If I'm talking to Twitter or Square, I don't have to, if I, I never want to again, right? And so there's this interesting brand new layer, which we've never really thought about um, with every organization now. So you used to pick or choose organizations that were mostly remote, remote but you know, Siemens has said that 130,000 of their employees can work two to three days a week remote, uh, right? And, and I think that's probably the model we'll see more and more of is this hybrid model where you're still in commuting distance from the office. Um, you're spending more time there, but more time at home saves money. You can reduce office capacity, right? All, all those all those sorts of things while keeping that interpersonal connection. Now, there's still risk and opportunity for organizations with that, right? If you're um, headquartered in San Francisco and your employees are working outside of the city, you can actually pay less tax for the portion of days they're out. Or if you're an asset manager or hedge fund in New York City, same, same story. Um, and there's considerations if you're in Europe and you've got people commuting across the French Swiss border, you still have to monitor the 25 day, 25% threshold. Otherwise you get into social security challenges. So mm -hmm. I think we'll see more people wanting that sort of flexibility, close ties, but not fully remote. But I think we also will see you know, a, a massive explosion and growth of people that are hired full-time remote, maybe come in a quarter, uh, a year and those sorts of things. And so, you know, for individuals, uh, who had been have been thinking about what's the right sort of career path within an organization or you know between organizations, this new layer of opportunity comes in. And I think ultimately, right at the end of the day, the best companies want to find the best talent in a way to make them productive, effective, and keep them engaged for a long career. And so for me, this is just a, a, a new layer of, of that flexibility and that offering. And it won't make sense for all roles in all situations. But I think anybody that comes down with a blanket, you know, it's in office five days a week, you know, you are going to be cutting off access to part of the talent pool that, you, you know, you may not want to lose for sure. Yeah, um, the other thing that I'm, and again, this is kind of just a broader observation, I guess, is is that 
um, people are making different decisions about where they want to live because of that, what you've yeah. just talked about, right? So we're factoring that on about, fine, I had my 45 minute commute, et cetera, and I only have to do yeah. this now three days a week, or maybe in the future I will, and at the moment I'm not yeah. doing it at all. But actually, if you're only doing it three days a week and et cetera, why not make it an hour and a half commute uh, and actually have a bigger space? Because funnily enough, when we were locked down, being in a three bedroom bo box with, you know, kids, cat and whatever, and working at the kitchen table wasn't a particularly uh, desirable thing. So we know that's impacting, for example, the housing market and people are making different decisions on where they want to be located on the basis of A, they could be remote a lot more of the time and they'll maybe make a sacrifice and make a longer travel, but they have a much better lifestyle for the rest of the time when they're there and uh, et cetera as well. So I think there's almost the, that becomes a magnifier on what you just talked about as well, because almost by definition, um, come, people are going to choose to be that. And, you know, you don't need to be based in New York or Seattle or the Bay area when you can be sat in the, in the Midwest somewhere with something that costs a fraction of the money, et cetera. And you're still pretty much set up to do that. But obviously then there's other consequences around it as well, because when you do go in, you're now flying in or you're now doing this, whatever you're going to do rather than that. And we've all, I think most certainly in my, my lifetime, I know people have done that by mm. exception, right? Yeah. There's always been some people that have done that, but actually now this is almost everybody or the majority are going to be certainly in a knowledge in the knowledge economy yeah. and things like this um that's going to be a really significant change i think so yeah absolutely i think we'll we'll see a massive explosion in um less frequent but longer um sort of team get togethers right i was talking to somebody who's who's been working remote for a decade but they used to come into an office once a quarter for a week and that allowed this personal touch and interaction and it was a they were sort of surprised by actually how different and challenging this year has been for somebody that spent you know 80 percent of their time remote um it was it was a change and so i think we'll see that uh, we'll see that for sure and you know if anything it just it goes to the it is just going to keep getting more and more complex. And it's a, it's about sort of preparing for that and, and making sure that from a talent perspective, right, organizations can uh, can support that. I know uh, we are uh, approaching time here. Holly, I just wanted to check uh, check in and see if there are any um, any questions from the audience we wanted to try and squeeze in uh, before, uh, before we wrapped today. Yeah, yeah, we've got uh, one or two that's come in. So uh, the first one is, um, so this year's nine grid, you've thrown out the traditional model of talent management. What does this mean for major players like uh, Workday and Success Factors? And how do you expect them to think about integrated specialist partners going forward? So, I mean, we know that the ACM players have made a, a land grab for more of the talent processes, right? And, and as they push more into skills, that's getting even bigger again. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, the, I think the case to move away from uh, old school on-prem HR to cloud HCM is, you know, is, is, is clearly there in the background. And, you know, we expect that to continue to happen. But I think the, the slide that I showed, which said it, this is about ecosystem, it's never about system, right? So for all that they might want you to think it's all about one system of record, one architecture, that's never been true. And um, I guess more now with the rise of the specialisms and the rise of the disruption piece, that's that's become more clearly the case. So we expect them to grab more land, but at the same time, companies need to put that together with specialist solutions around this. And, you know, and the Topia kind of proposition is a really good case in point. I think one of the things we're really interested in, a lot of the vendors, we've got actually a project at the moment looking at the HR ecosystem and how it all fits together, is the ecosystemness, if I can call it that, of the solutions, how well they play and share with others and this is not just about basic employee data it's about workflow it's about skills it's around an, an experience sharing kind of thing and actually this is sometimes where I think if, if, if they're trying to control too much of the space they sometimes mm -hmm. uh, can be found wanting but we expect that to become an important an important thing the other final point I'd make on that which is really really important we mainly focus on um, European multinational companies, UK, European, and, and European and the globals. You don't get very big in Europe before you become multinational. Mm -hmm. Two thirds of the company 
that's, that we deal with have a decentralized or federated operating model for HR. They don't have one HR system of record. They have multiplicity of payrolls. They have a multiplicity of supporting um, HR applications and so on. So, you know, unless you're literally going to solve all parts of that problem in all geographies all at once, that's a huge undertaking before you can start to address some of these talent priorities, that strikes me as a, as a difficult sell, you know, particularly in the, very, in, the, in the kind of climate we are. So we expect that to continue to, the, you know, the, them to continue to rise, but we also expect the specialists and the disruptors to continue to rise as well. And it's about how they blend them together rather than just trying to control the whole real estate. Yeah, no, I think that's incredibly interesting and in align certainly with what we've seen. Obviously, we've got a, a semi, somewhat unique relationship with Workday as they're an investor in, in Topia and we've got a, a approved integration. But, you know, we're, we're doing similar off the uh, off the shelf integrations with success factors and Oracle and ADP and, and all the other, other folks. And I think mm-hmm. it, for, for a large part of exactly what you say, yes, there are you, you find the auto organization that has a global HRS system. Um, rarely do they even if you have that rarely do they have a global payroll system. Right. And so when we look at, you know, expat payroll delivery, which is a, a key part of our, our, our value proposition, right, you know, we're integrating and, and delivering instructions to, you know, 100 different entities around the world, which maybe is 67 different payroll systems, right, because there's all this regional regional mix. And so I think that, you know, what we've seen from a, from a market perspective is, is folks that are looking at our technology, how does it work with mine? How easy is it to integrate? What case studies and examples do you have of integrations you've already done? So it's the prove to me that it fits in my world, but I recognize that I'm I'm building a, a patchwork or a landscape of solutions to solve the the bigger problem. Um, so that's that, that's certainly a, a trend that we're seeing on, on our side as well. Wonderful. Well, uh, we're we're just over the hour, so um, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. And uh, a special thank you to our speakers, David and Steve. Uh, Please look up the recording. And if you do have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to get in contact. Uh, Thanks again for joining. And we look forward to seeing you again.